water. Everything looks good. Argus is in the water. This is an audio slate for NA-137 dive 
Go ahead, Winch. Okay, to increase speed to 15 meters a minute. Roger, increase speed to 15 meters a minute. Okay, increasing speed. I'll stop, Fazer. Are you guys ready for control? We are go for control. And above it. Hey, you've got a Dex 4 up, comes.
Welcome to Nautilus Live, everybody. It is March 23rd, about 8.23 a.m. Hawaii time, and we've just began our descent to an unnamed, unexplored seamount south of the Palmyra Atoll, which is within the boundaries of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And we're hoping to get down pretty deep today, 3,700 meters, maybe a little more. So if you stay with us through the blue water, we'll get to see the bottom. And feel free to submit your questions for us to ask in the meantime. What is that sparkly stuff? Hmm. It's animals. Oh. What kind of animals? Shiny ones. <laughs> <laughs> are they shiny because of our lights or are they shiny because of bioluminescence? It's probably because of light from the surface, um, we probably wouldn't be able to pick up bioluminescence with our cameras. Mm Thank you to our audience members sending us good vibes. We'll take them all. We have some good vibes as well for this one. I think we're going to do good. And once again, I want to mention that we are in, within the boundaries of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, which is an area of almost 500,000 square miles in the Central Pacific Ocean. It includes seven islands and assholes, Baker, Howland, Jarvis Island, Johnson Wake and Palmyra Atoll, and King Kingman Reef. We are currently a bit south of Palmyra Atoll. And the monument itself includes 165 known sea mounts that are hotspots of species abundance and diversities. And as one of the most pristine tropical marine environments in the world, we are very excited to see what we find down at the bottom. So for those of you who were turning in last night, we did have um, a small snag with the cable. Do we want to explain what happened there for those who are asking? Uh, yeah, we used um, our, our, uh, our tether between Hercules and Argus. Uh, we run a lift line between them. Uh, so that's used on recovery to uh, haul in Hercules and lift it with the crane. Um, and to, to hold the lift line, uh, tight on the tether to avoid it flopping around while we're on the bottom. We use a what's called a daisy chain, which is another line that wraps around it, keeps it tight. And basically, uh, the, the daisy chain came, uh, or the lift line came out through the daisy chain up near Argus, and there was a loop that was protruding pretty close to the aft thruster on Argus, and so we had a, a risk of getting tangled or uh, sucked up to the thruster and on bottom the problem we couldn't resolve the problem so we had to recover because uh, getting a lift line 
sucked up would not be good and wouldn't be able to um, easily recover the vehicles as we as we normally do. It'd be a, it would have been a dead vehicle recovery as well. Thank you for explaining that. So for those just tuning in, we are on our new watch, and I think we can go ahead and just do introductions. My name is Jamie, and I'm the comms lead. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Emil Petroncio, watch leader. Corley Rodriguez, I'm in the science seat. Hello, everyone. This is Leilani Sublan in the data logger seat. This is Megan Putz, navigator. Uh, Robert Waters, I'm the herd pilot. Jake Bonney, Argus pilot. Dave Robertson, lead video engineer, and sitting in the video chair. Back to you. Thank you. So how long are we thinking it'll take us to get to the bottom today? I just lost my mouse. Where'd it go? Um, what's it say? Two and a half hours? Sounds right. It's Two and a half hours. Okay. Where did my mouse go? We have a lot of great questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Do the KVM. You going to run down there and check it out? Yeah. That's hardwired, so. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I mean, all this stuff's still working. It's, if they don't put it, the KVM in the, in the hangar over to view only mode, then it's, yeah. Yeah, they stole my mouse. <laughs> So science team, is there anything specific that we're hoping to see today? Well, we hope to see some high diversity, high density coral and sponge communities, uh, but also you were on the lookout for other odds and ends down there. Um, it looks promising from what we saw at bottom on the last dive. Uh, and we're after some good rocks. Hard to see whether they're good or not. We'll just uh, have Coralie use her sixth sense and uh -huh. make the call. It definitely looked promising last night when we first touched bottom. Yeah. So I'm hoping right when we get to the bottom, just collect. Ten rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Load up. As quick as we can. Yeah, there looked like there were a lot of loose ones on our when yeah. we were getting near the bottom. We saw a sizable sea cucumber down there. <laughs> 30, 40 centimeters, maybe. Mm. Well, <laughs> still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> So I was talking with Megan this morning about them, and it's a, a question why uh, they can grow so large in, uh, in, uh, in abyssal depths, where there's not, doesn't seem to be enough nutrients in the sediment to support their body size. So there's some source of nutrients that remains to be determined. But uh, Steve reminded us this morning that anything we see at a depth of 3,700 meters is noteworthy. So we'll take a nice 
good look around when we reach bottom and just image as much as we can anything we come across. Dang it. And I want to see the Dumbo octopus that I missed yesterday. Yeah. Oh, there was a Dumbo octopus. I missed right. that yeah. as well. A brief glimpse. Uh, we need more octopuses. Absolutely. 100%. I knew I wouldn't find it again. <laughs> USB gags. Saw some uh, squid yeah. in the lights of the <laughs> ship as we were recovering <laughs> the vehicles last night, <laughs> this morning. There you go. But Yay. no sharks. We huh? did see a shark t right as we started descending oh, today. This, all right. Um, actually, one of our questions from a second grader is how many sharks do we see in a week? Um, hmm. And I guess it depends on the location. But where we are now, we see quite a few. In fact, I think every day I've been able to see a white tip shark. Right. I bet it's the same ones. Probably. <laughs> 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 You're like, oh, you got the good stuff over here. Yeah, maybe a s there's a few gelatinous creatures flowing by. Jake, we have a shout out to you and how legendary you are. Already. <laughs> oh my. Already Thanks, started. Mom. Fan <laughs> favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're a legend now. <laughs> Not just a legend in your own mind. Never going to hear the end of it. <laughs> Tether's looking good. So Hercules can go, theoretically, 4,000 meters deep. We're hoping to get pretty close to that today at around 3,750 meters deep, which is very far down. Three hundred and seventy-five atmospheres. One of our second graders wants to know if anyone knows how heavy the ship is. I think it's on the web page. The displacement. Hmm. I don't have that number on the tip of my tongue. Let's see if I can find that for you. Pressure at bottom will be 5,512 pounds per square inch. Not too shabby. Question. Tonnage, 1,249 gross tons. Sounds about right, yeah. So if you're looking for more statistics about EV Nautilus or about any of the ROVs on board, you can go to nautiluslive.org. And if you click on science and tech, each um, ship and each ROV and some of our technology systems all have their own pages with lots of statistics and backgrounds and photos to teach you more about how they work.
fun fact is uh, up till just a couple years ago, they used to have rotary phones in the in the state rooms and had a phone listing. And one of the listings was for the Volkspolizei. This was an East German ship. <laughs> <laughs> Political officer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alexander Humboldt, right? Yeah. Another great explorer. Yeah, some of the signage is still, you see it, like yeah. remnants, German signage. On like doors and We have a mixed bag of 110 and 220 volt outlets everywhere. Yeah. So you gotta have your power adapters handy. Yeah, that always gets me. <laughs> oh, look at there's a squid. Oh. Yeah. And what's that little what star? That? Jelly of some. Wow, no. Huh. That looked. Uh, wow. I had never seen that little twirling one. Oh, that could be like a foraminifera or something. Midwater madness right now. <laughs> There's another squid. Siphonophore. Shrimp. Yes, um, same object. Yeah. Ooh, that's a nice jelly. Oh, cute. You get a box around this, Jake was uh, saying HPU, you know? Yeah, make it, all, make it look all pretty. Yeah. The fonts on these things are just too tiny, you know. I yeah. can't read all that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's like, eh? So our vehicles are remote operated, which means there are no people in them. They are operated by us up here, specifically by our pilots. And a question for our pilots, someone wants to know, is there something unique you have to do to clean the vehicles and specifically the cameras on them because they, they go such deep lengths? We just we use a camera camera cleaner like a yeah. glass yeah. foaming cleaner and we use a um, like microfiber cloth. To yeah. Just clean them before dives. Yeah, we had we now have the proper lens cleaner stuff. Yeah. yeah. The 
the lenses are corrected for being in water, so that otherwise uh, the picture would be distorted. So they have a special, the shape of the front glass is special. Hmm. Is that true for the uh, experimental one, the 4K? No. Is Still? It? Yeah, yeah, both, of, so. both yeah. of those would be correct. Yeah, those. yeah that's correct. Yeah. The, uh, the thing is, is that lenses uh, are built for being used in air. And so uh, since the transmissive properties of water are different than air, uh, then it has to be pre-corrected before it gets to the lens inside the camera housing. was something another something there's a jelly and there's this fish following us it looks like it might be a lantern fish and a squid I'm getting a little bit of everything today yeah well we're at that depth where you have your, um, your deep scattering layer that's where all the animals hang out during the day trying to hide from predators so it's nice and dark down here if you are a small animal, it's a good place to hide. But at nighttime, you come to the surface to feed because at the surface, that's where all the food is produced. So these animals will vertically migrate 500 meters to the surface every day or every evening and then back down every morning. Something that was observed back uh, when Navy ships started carrying sonar. The greatest migration on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the animals that are making this migration are very, very small. Like covopods, for example, they're almost microscopic. You can sometimes see some of them with your uh, naked eye, but they're less than a centimeter in length, usually a lot smaller. And they're traveling, you know, really long distances, 500 meters. We have a question about bioluminescence and whether or not we would be able to see it if the ROV lights were off. Uh, we have tried that, turning the lights off and um, trying to observe bioluminescence. It's actually very hard for our cameras to detect it just because we're, they're built to um, work under regular lighting conditions provided by the ROV. But if you did have a specialized camera aboard, you could observe bioluminescence with that. So other scientists have had other cameras brought aboard vehicles in order to observe bioluminescence in situ, so uh, while we are diving. And a number of creatures bioluminesce, even on the seafloor, a number of corals, um, like bamboo corals, they will bioluminesce if disturbed. What is the um, what is the reasoning for when they're disturbed? They'll do that. Is that to scare off the what they presume to be predators? So one theory is they produce this bioluminescent light in order to sort of call for help. Uh -huh. uh, basically, something is disturbing them, at trying to feed on them, and they're like, "Oh no, this isn't good for me. I'm going to ask for predators from around the area." for assistance, basically. So it makes these flashy um, bioluminescent light show, and that means that other animals, larger animals in the area looking for food, possibly the thing that's predating on the coral, might get attracted to that coral 
and take away that coral predator. Hmm. Pretty slick. Mm-hmm. Pretty good theory, too. Other animals, like copepods, will use it as a, um, a mating signal, so they'll, like, create little bursts of uh, bioluminescence in order to signal to potential mates. Um, you could produce bioluminescence as a distraction uh, in order to escape a predator. So you just leave a whole bunch of bright light in one location and you zoom off in another direction. And I'm sure there's a bunch of things that bioluminescence is used for um, that we haven't quite discovered yet. Um, some fishes will use it in order to blend in with the ambient light that's filtering down from the surface. So they have bioluminescent cells on their underbellies that will match the lighting from above. So they're basically invisible when observed from below. I imagine it's not an easy thing to study in nature. It's really hard to study anything in the ocean, especially in the deep ocean. So we've been doing our best over the years to gather information about what animals do um, in their environment. And it's pretty exciting when we learn something new, as we do on every dive. But the midwater, where we're, we are right now, descending down to the seafloor, is the largest biome on our planet. So there is so much space and there is so much biomass in this blue water that we have yet to discover and explore. So every time we go down, we might see something unexpected. One of our audience members is mentioning that some siphonophores have bioluminescence at the end of their tentacles to use as a lure. Yeah, so um, a number of animals will use bioluminescence as a lure. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the anglerfish. It has that bioluminescent lure in front of its mouth, dangles down, attracts you know, potential food items that way. Absolutely. I was an angler fish for Halloween once. I carved an angler fish pumpkin. I would love to see a photo of that. Yeah, I have a photo on my phone. I'll show you later. Did you put a little candle in for the lure? Uh, I tried to make um, a lure with like a little um, tea candle with a some tin foil, <laughs> but it wasn't very stable. Still incredibly impressive. Mm -hmm. LEDs, Megan, we need, yeah. we need to get you LEDs. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't have LEDs at the time. I did oh, have tea okay. candles. All right, okay. I always have LEDs on here. Yeah, who doesn't have LEDs? Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me, my, obviously, <laughs> I need to get on Amazon right my, now. My pumpkin last Halloween had stuff flashing and just faulty colors. Uh, Are you an expert, awesome. an expert pumpkin carver? Carver, no. The carving is uh, quite ugly, so it's pretty standard, you know, triangles for eyes, jaggedy mouth, that kind of stuff. But I spiff it up with the uh, flashing light. So expert designer <laughs> and decorator. Yeah, the electronic part I'm uh, much better at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my last pumpkin was a, a school of hammerhead sharks. Wow. I think this Halloween we should ask oh, our audience to submit pictures. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's pretty cool. great. Of deep sea inspired pumpkin carvings. I like it. Yeah. I feel like more people should get into deep sea inspired pumpkin carving. <laughs> <laughs> Does Maybe that's a new meme coming up. <laughs> Let's see your pumpkins. It doesn't have to be Halloween. <laughs> it's 
my hobby. I thought everyone did that year round. <laughs> well, weren't the original jack o' lanterns carved out of turnips? I think. Oh, uh, I have no, I have no idea. I, I feel like I, I learned that, like, in Europe. I could be wrong, but. Gourds, turnips. Well, maybe whatever they had whatever on hand. Whatever was on hand. Yeah. Eaten afterwards. Uh, That is really impressive. And not a real pumpkin. It's giving me like Disney Halloween vibes and I like it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Been to Disney for the Halloween party, by the way. <laughs> we have a question here about water pressure and what is the most water pressure Hercules can withstand? So we can go to 4,000 meters and it's Pressure is roughly 1.65 times the depth. 1.5. Well, every 10 meters 1. is uh, an atmosphere. 6,000 psi. So what? what 6,000 psi? Yeah. About by. no. Right. Oh, we had 4,000 meters. Yeah. I don't know. 400 it's times like 14.7 times so. the depth. 5,000. 5,880 5, <laughs> pounds per square inch. That is a lot. I thought it was 1.5 times the water depth. I thought I think that's an overestimation. So every I think that's a very rough guess. Yeah, it's like an overestimate. Yeah. Well, an easy uh, conversion is every 10 meters is an atmosphere. be the issue uh, do you think Bob beyond 4,000 the syntactic foam or uh, some other equipment there's quite a few things that are that yeah those implosions like, yeah I think like the sonars yeah it's sort of a mixed bag on on hurricane Argus for what their max depth rating are but yeah I think the foam is is 4,000 meter Now, what is the foam you're referring to? Uh, it's, it's called syntactic foam, and it's little microscopic um, glass spheres, and, and they're embedded in a epoxy matrix. So, so glass is really, has a really strong tensile strength, but it's, it has to relate to how uniform the glass beads are, like for the depth rating and how uh, well formed they are, like uniform. So. It's called the yellow part of Hercules. The yeah. yellow part. Which makes it slightly positively buoyant. Yeah. It's uh, like 30 pounds per cubic foot for the foam that we have. Hmm. We have a very interesting question about whether anyone on board has any superstitions pertaining to having lucky dives. <laughs> um, I don't, but it's round robin. Does anyone have any superstitions or rituals? <laughs> Maybe a lucky pair of socks they wear? Well, Hercules has a, has a, a tiki up oh. front. Yeah. Oil well, the tiki for every time. Yeah, we, so the tiki was made by uh, Bruce Cowron. Quite a few years back, probably 
15 or 20 years maybe? I don't know. It's been around for a long time. And so the ritual is to oil the tiki before every dive. <laughs> As an intern, they don't tell you why. They just they, they throw. They're like, they're like, you're the one. You're doing it. Yeah. Don't forget. I think Jason used to have a teddy bear in a motorcycle outfit. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> The uh, van has a small shrine dedicated to Mardi Gras. <laughs> we have Mardi Gras beads oh, okay. and, a, and a king cake baby. Uh, we commissioned the system in uh, Gulfport, Mississippi uh, during uh, Mardi Gras time. And we uh, went to a Mardi Gras parade and got beads. And, uh, and then we uh, had several king cakes uh, that we were <laughs> eating during the few weeks that we were there. And uh, that was in uh, early, uh, 2020, so about two years ago, when we uh, right after we built the, the van, so uh, we saved some of the beads, we saved a king cake baby, and uh, they're uh, enshrined on the wall. Very cool. So someone has a very specific question about fossilized sea urchins. Um, Whoa. <laughs> does this sound like anything anyone might be able to speak on? I can't speak to urchins. Mm -hmm. I know that there are, I've seen some beautiful fossilized uh, crinoids. Uh, yeah. Sea lilies, the stalked ones. Uh, and they were from, they were obtained from Kansas. Oh. I wasn't expecting you to say Kansas. Yeah, <laughs> and they were on display at the one LA uh, yeah, Museum of Natural History. Four seven six five. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, crinoids are one of the um, animals that, that goes back really far in the fossil one. record. Okay. And so we actually know of more species of crinoids from fossils than we actually do from living crinoids that we've seen in the ocean. And are a lot of those fossils found in currently landlocked areas like Kansas? Um, they're found all over the place. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of places used to be ocean. So you'll find fossils, ocean fossils, in places that you might not expect. But remember that the continents have moved over millions of years throughout Earth's history. So, and sea level has risen and fallen over that time multiple times. So you'll find oceanic fossils in areas that are now, you know, very land. We believe we found a fossilized um, mammoth tusk yeah, off the coast of Southern California, um, but it was petrified. So we weren't able to date it. Uh, but an expert at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology suggested it looked like a mammoth tusk. And they were, they used to live on the Channel Islands, the oh. miniature ones. They swam. They swam. I swam a short distance, made it to the Channel Islands, which were, the Northern Channel Islands were all connected uh, in the last ice age when sea level was 400 feet lower. And uh, so these m mammoths, due to less food there on the islands, became smaller, became miniaturized, but then they were eventually wiped out. But uh, so, yeah, it's po possible they swam to other islands, or somebody took a tusk with them on a little boat trip. Uh, so, this was all part of the, the 
interest in exploring these sea caves off of the California borderland to possibly find evidence of the early uh, migrations uh, 13, maybe 15,000 years ago that likely happened along the coast from Asia. It's amazing what we can tell from history about fossils. Yeah, so we haven't... Uh, I mean, they found fossilized, uh, or not fossilized, but they found human femurs on uh, one of the Channel Islands, dated it to 13,000 years ago, so we know they were here. Wow. And they've been found further up the coast in Oregon. And at that time, the land bridge wasn't open yet. I mean, there, there was a land bridge across the Bering Strait, but the uh, glaciers covered uh, Canada and there wasn't easy passage south until later. And we've been asked to keep an eye out for fossilized, perhaps fossilized sponges uh, mm. that might be manganese encrusted. Yeah. Manganese, that's, that's something that you're interested in, Corley? Yeah, the paramanganese crust, yeah. And since they form over such a long time period, you would know that it's a fossil because it's at least a million years old, a yeah. million yeah. years old. One to ten millimeters per million years? Yeah. Wow. Hopefully we'll find some samples for you. Yeah, we definitely will. Very hopeful. We have about an hour on the bottom until our watch is up. Hoping to collect <laughs> all the rocks before everyone else gets here. <laughs> there must be something satisfying about collecting it yourself as well. Yeah. Or being, I suppose it's not you collecting it, but being on watch when it's collected and then getting to see it yeah. in the wet lab. Yeah, at some point it'll become a affordable, more affordable to mine in the ocean than on land for these rare earth minerals unless we you know don't need them anymore unless we come up with new technology for all the devices we use but that's that's a long shot <laughs> all right I'm speed back up all right so i'm not a great fan of disturbing the uh, benthic environment but at the same time maybe we can through exploration find areas where it'll be least disruptive yeah uh, in the Argus. We could put H pack up. Uh, but I don't I don't have another unless Nav was able to bring up uh, Google Earth or something. But there is a request to, for a map of where we are diving. But we, we could zoom out a I bit can on zoom out. H pack, yeah. And then bring that up into satellite feed uh, three I guess. So, it's pretty bumpy. Hmm. It's kind of nice to see the new area that we mapped. And there, okay. That's so, good. yeah, we are just um, south and a little bit west of Palmyra Atoll. It's about 40 nautical miles. Yep. And uh, that swath um, in the lower part of the screen is what we mapped on our way to the dive site to get the best data available, cleanest. So maybe we could zoom in on that patch. If you're looking for the map we're referring to, it's on feed oh, yeah. three, or you can also see it on the quad. Right. Now we're zooming in on the patch and it's nicely contoured. 
So the contours you're seeing are um, the white ones are 50 meters apart and the black ones are 10 meters. So this is a uh, relatively small seamount. We're starting at a depth of 3750, uh, 3750 meters roughly. And we'll be going to the summit at about um, 1970 meters. We're working our way up along a ridge with waypoints selected to get us to local topographic highs. And uh, I, th I imagine it's going to be pretty steep in parts. So. Yeah, so the closer these lines are together, the steeper the slope. And I can turn mm -hmm. on the slope map. So here you see the slope map and areas where it's red or orange, those are areas of high slope. Um, so these really dark one areas are going to be more vertical, whereas these purple areas are going to be flat. So the average slopes along these waypoints, I'm not sure of the distance over which they were averaged, but they're five, uh, range from five to 50 degrees. Five zero degrees, and that's pretty steep. But locally, it could be a sheer cliff. I guess yeah. we don't know until we get there. You don't really know. So, like, um, our mapping can give us information uh, within a twenty meter block, but it, you don't really know what the small scale is going to be like, so where there's going to be a boulder, uh, you'd have to have a toad sonar that's close to the bottom in order to get higher resolution, or you go down there and check it out yourself. But we do need mapping before we dive so that we understand what the topography is going to be like. We want to target areas that might be ridges, because that's where we're going to see those high density coral and sponge communities. Uh, ridges on seamounts usually host these types of communities because ridges are going to have more hard substrate that is exposed to currents. So you have higher flow rates, which means more food to the animals that are living there, more likelihood of having uh, bare substrate for those animals to settle down on. So it's basically the best place on a seamount to find the types of communities we're trying to target with our study. It's also a good place to find rocks. Uh, areas that are flat tend to be more sedimented, not the best place for rocks or corally. So win-win for both the biologists and the geologists on this one. Yeah, and uh, Steve, lead scientist on this expedition, uh, wanted to redive in this location because um, of that. This area seems like it can fulfill the most needs of everyone. Yeah, that's the important thing about our operations here with EVU Nautilus is um, we're not just work working with one uh, scientist or one group. Uh, the science that we do out here is for everyone. So we want to make sure that each dive can achieve a number of objectives, um, getting rock samples or biological samples for many different scientists that are excited to study uh, the deep sea. It's re very expensive to do the work that we do. Um, not everybody can get the funding to, to do this type of work. So what's really great about Nautilus is that all the data that we collect is available to anyone. So how can people access our data should they be interested? Um, you can access the data on uh, our website, Nautilus, what's it? Nautilus Live. Nautilus Live yep. org. Yep, the uh, geological specimens are uh, maintained at the University of Rhode Island. And the biological ones go to the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology.
And speaking of the specimens, we have a question about how we keep samples safe bef um, before they get back to shore, how we keep them intact. Yeah, so um, there's a couple different ways. Uh, normally for biological samples, we uh, store them in 95% ethanol um, and then keep them in the fridge. Uh, last, the last expedition I went on, uh, one of Megan's, uh, I guess, someone at Hawaii wanted sea cucumbers for their intestines and we stored those in a minus 80 freezer. Oh. Um, yeah. But uh, for rocks, we normally just rinse them off with tap water, dry them, and pack them away. I guess it's easier to keep the rocks. Yeah, a lot easier. <laughs> Although, um, since Beth Orcutt uh, wants some of the ferromanganese crust to study the microbes in it, we're actually breaking off pieces of those, rinsing them with DI water, and then storing them in the minus 80. Oh, yeah. So, speaking of where we do all this work, um, we're going to show you our wet lab, which is empty at the moment, but you can see some of the samples kind of in the in the left-hand corner drying. Is that what that is? It's Sorry, let me oh, come over Oh, you there. can't see that. <laughs> yeah, those are some of the rock samples in the left. Yes, I believe so, in the back. Yeah. I know you can see some of the um, refrigeration for different temperatures for different samples. And after we recover the herc and bring the samples in, it's kind of a mad dash, and it's really fun to watch what's going on here in the wet lab. And again, this is on satellite feed three, um, mm -hmm. if, if you're looking, watching at home. But yeah, the rock samples are to the right of the refrigerators, actually. Yeah. In that little bit. Yeah, yeah, I see them. The bins, yeah. And then, yeah. And hopefully in 18-ish hours, maybe, we'll have some more. Yeah. 4 a.m. I don't know if we have to wake up for <laughs> that, too. <laughs> we need to talk to Megan. <laughs> That's the best thing about being on the ship. Time is both very important but also irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sleeping is irrelevant <laughs> on the ship. So I imagine that some of the studying of the specimens has to be done on shore, but some can be done in the wet lab, correct? Um. So I think, it, well, I don't know. I think a lot of things people, I'm not sure about the biological samples, but a lot of stuff you need to study the geology. Um, we don't have the tools out here. Uh, for instance, we don't have a rock saw um, on the ship. Uh, we used to have one that was pretty bad, um, <laughs> but they're planning on, they just ordered a new one. It didn't get here in time for our expedition, but yeah, we'll it be arrived, here. like, right after we left. Yeah, it arrived, like, the day we left. Um, and then, uh, but it will be on here for the next expedition. Um, but there's a bunch of other stuff that you need to do to prepare rock samples. Uh, I'm not quite sure what Amber needs to do, who's looking at the geochronology of the lavas. Um, but, you know, it's definitely more intensive lab work. Um, this is what we, our wet lab is really just to preserve everything until we can get to shore to fully investigate. Yeah, for the biological samples, um, we can do some preliminary identification. Um, sometimes when we're looking at it on camera, we can't make a really good ID, but if we do have an expert on the ship, that knows these animals, we might be able to give it a better ID, but a lot of times the things we collect are brand new to science, so that means we don't know what it is, and we need a taxonomic ex expert to examine the specimen, and then they will uh, write up a description of that specimen and submit it for publication. 
and at that time that's when that animal be, will be named and we'll know what it is so that's a really exciting process that takes a lot of time and you need an expert to help you with so that person's not going to be doing that work on the ship they will receive the specimen after it's um, gone ashore and study it when it gets there We have a question about whether or not there are pets on the ship. And unless you count those red-footed <laughs> boobies that uh, made the top deck our home a few <laughs> nights ago. Um, no, unfortunately. I wish I could bring one down. I've, I've lobbied for a ship cat, but. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of, I think all of us would love it if we could, but it's just not really feasible. I had pets on the ship, on the Atlantis. <laughs> I had a saltwater fish tank in my cabin. <laughs> Oh, oh, really? Yeah. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. The problem was people would get things out of the, engineers would get things out of the seawater strainer, like crabs, mm -hmm. and throw them in my saltwater tank. Oh, and no. Destroy oh, all no. the corals. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a pretty healthy rotation of pet photos every day where we just all share <laughs> the photos of our beloved fur babies back home. <laughs> it's what keeps us going. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I have to say my phone's probably like 50% cat photos. <laughs> They're just so cute. I have to take all the photos, right now. Mm -hmm. We have someone asking about plants growing in the ocean and okay. how deep they can go. I imagine it's as deep as the sunlight goes. Basically, um, so sunlight actually penetrates further than where plants can live. Um, after a certain amount, or after a certain depth, you're not going to see plant life just because there isn't enough sunlight for photosynthesis, but there still is enough light for vision. So that's where you'll see, you know, the fishes with really large eyes. Um, they're capturing every photon of light possible in order to resolve their vision. However, that's not enough light for photosynthesis. So you're not gonna see uh, plant life below 200 meters. In a lot of areas, you're not gonna see it, um, you know, going deeper than maybe 50 meters. It depends on uh, how clear the water is. So some of these creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean, since they can't use photosynthesis, there are other chemical reactions that they use. Yeah, at, at vents you'll see chemo chemosynthesis, but in general where we're diving, um, all the food that these animals are eating is made at the surface and has been filtering down the water column. So basically everything, all that energy is coming from the surface and eventually making its way to the sea floor. We have someone who's interested in the sleep schedules of those of us in the control van who are on watches. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> what is sleep? It so, can, yeah. Yeah, it depends, but uh, generally the watches, we work a four eight shift, so that's four hours on, eight hours off, but um, that, <laughs> it's uh, very loose. It's gen you're generally working more than that, um, especially the ROV pilots, when there's an issue, they have to work past, like last night, a lot of them had to work past their watches uh, for our science team. So once we collect the samples, um, 
and get them on deck, their the watch schedules kind of dissipate and everyone's working to mm -hmm. get everything ready in the lab. Um, it's about an extra hour. Yeah. It's a couple hours last, or yesterday. I think we yeah. recovered, I don't know. I think we're all done by like three maybe. Mm. Yeah. Around uh, like 2.30, because I know we were still able to have some dessert. <laughs> yeah. We do measure time, I think, by meals. Yeah. Um, which are all very delicious, but specifically timed, and they, they help me keep track of the day anyway. Also, a lot of us were um, learning how to, learning what to do in the wet lab, so mm -hmm. we've taken a, a bit longer. Time, yeah. Yeah, so we have eight hours between watches, but yeah, there is some work to do or training, and so you just have to try to carve out your times as best you can. Cat nap here or there. <laughs> And so we'll occasionally get a little break. Well, the navigators won't, but uh, <laughs> the rest of the team will get a break when we're mapping. Uh, but uh, yeah, the mappers never sleep. I mean, we kind of sleep sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're always um, on our watch schedule, no matter what, because we've always got something to do. Either yeah. we are navigating during a dive or we're actively mapping and cleaning data. Oh, Ooh, that's Siphon 4. Siphon 4 that maybe got snagged it's on the porch. It's totally snagged yeah, on the porch. Yeah. He's going to be with us for a while. Wow. So what we're seeing are those uh, feeding tentacles. Can we zoom in that? Yeah, I don't know any white balances or anything, but... Yeah, and those sort of little lobey parts, those are its swimming bells that are coming off. Hey, Dave. Yep, ready when you are. Yeah, go ahead and zoom. Ooh. Oh, kind of looks great. like string lights or something. It does. <laughs> Those are all little or individual organisms that make you up, making up the colony. You think these are stinging cells? Yeah, yeah. So those are the, the cells that are going to send out those little stings. So if you've ever been uh, stung by um, a man of war, that's what that is. Can't you die from a man of war sting? Um, it depend well, some of, well, it depends on what you're calling a man of war. Um, the ones that we see in Hawaii, the little blue ones, or bluebells, um, they, they won't uh, kill you, but they uh, definitely are not pleasant. The ones in Australia are the crazy ones, right? Yeah, well, everything in Australia yeah. is the crazy ones. <laughs> well, the deadly ones in, that I'm aware of in Australian waters are the... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, box jellies. There you oh go. yeah, box definitely. Jellies. Tiny. And they're but seasonal, right? Are they seasonal? Uh, or am I thinking of the man of war? Uh, I'm not sure the seasonality, uh, but they occasionally do put nets up to try to protect swimmers at the beach, but they can be fatal. On Guam, they're pretty seasonal, uh, man of war and some of the occasional box jelly. So when we get, get a lot of, when we get um, strong winds during our trade wind season, they come around and wash up on our east coast windward side. Yeah, that's the same in Hawaii. We'll, we'll see them um, when we do have those strong winds bringing mm -hmm. them onto our shores. So you're not gonna go spear fishing then? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'll usually see them like washing up on the beach. So then you know you're like, well, mm -hmm. do I really want to go in the water today? Um, good way to protect yourself is to wear rash guards or long sleeves, leggings, things like that, to to keep them from stinging you. 
And even when they're washed up on shore, they can still, yeah, it's still steam. Oh, yeah. Or mm -hmm. hang on the ROV when you're working on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that too. Has that happened? Yeah. Uh, I think because we do a freshwater wash down, I think that triggers them and then they. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, um, the cells, they, they don't actively like try to sting you. So there's sort of like a harpoon basically that can get triggered by touch even after death. So yeah, that's why you don't want to touch jellies on the beach. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, mental note that. Yeah. <laughs> so they're individual organisms, but what's the like thread they're hanging on to? Um, so yeah, they, they build that to stay together. So they're sort of like their connective tissue. And the really interesting thing about siphonophores is, is, like you said, Jake, they're individuals, but they're very specialized. So you'll have the feeding uh, individuals, you'll have the um, swimming individuals, you'll have the reproductive individuals, and they work together as a colony, but uh, in essence, they're individual organisms. But Unlike, this would be considered one. Th yeah, this is like one, but there are many. <laughs> making up that one. And what is the connective tissue made of? Is it mucus? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably a little bit stronger than just like a mucus. Yeah. I'm really impressed with how well it's sticking with us. Now that's a long one. If it's like uh, bent in half around the, wrapped in half around the porch. Yeah, no, this is definitely Ooh. a pretty good size siphonophore, that's for sure. And a lot of times that as these individuals break apart, they can actually reform new colonies. This could be sample number one. <laughs> I don't know if we'll stick with this that long. <laughs> There's something interesting on the Argus cam. Oh yeah, that's a, a slismus. It's a type of jelly our tricky Medusa. That's like the one I know. There's there so many other jellies out there and I, I'm starting to learn them. Uh, my coworker, Tiffany, has been uh, educating me in the way of the jelly. The way of the jelly. Mm-hmm. You like that. <laughs> this is the way. Someone is asking about classification of siphonophores and if um, species are classified based on the colony or the specialized organisms. Um, they're classified based on the colony. Uh, siphonophores are nardarians, so they are related to corals and anemones. Um, but they are in a, their own group. So they're, they're not jellyfish, um, but they we refer to them as jellies because they're gelatinous. I wonder if they can stand up to the pressure change. Oh, I, I'm sure they can. They don't really have too much that would be affected by changes in pressure. Um, and being something that can't really control where it goes, basically planktonic organism, uh, they'll probably get swept from different depths depending on how the currents are moving. So I'm sure they can range in depth a lot more 
than other animals. So theoretically, we're not, we're just giving this one a ride <laughs> to somewhere it might go. Yeah, it probably wouldn't go <laughs> as deep as we're taking yeah. it right now. Um, but say if these uh, feeding um, individuals stick together, they might be able to regrow um, new swimming bells and continue on as a colony. Well, that's only if they find enough food. Steve says we're sequestering carbon. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. We have a Safanophore researcher commenting that uh, many of them have ranges that can go from the surface to greater than 6,000 meters. Whoa. It's amazing. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. They're truly interesting creatures. Yeah, I wonder if any one individual makes that full 6,000 meter journey and how long that takes. Oh, good point, because I suppose they're all coming and going consistently within that little community. Mm -hmm. They might be, you know, the same species, but is it the same individual that's uh, changing depth so drastically? I can't imagine a uh, current that would travel, you know, a downward current that like that. Uh, but like maybe over time, it just eventually filter down by With some the water mass you know yeah. maybe if it's somehow ended up where Antarctic bottom water is created yeah it just gets pushed down a bit that'd be pretty crazy yeah I don't know if they're that far south I don't know their range I don't know much about them well I'm, there's definitely siphonophores down south. I'm just okay. not sure about, um, you know, which species we'd see yeah. and how different the uh, community composition would be depending on where you are in the ocean. But they could slowly sink, I suppose. Yeah, I'm also not sure how long some of these organisms live. They could live really long lives. It'd be hard to actually be able to tell how old the siphonophore is. So from Science Steve, siphonophores and salps, another gelatinous transparent creature, uh, form large colonies in the Southern Ocean. Salps arguably are more important organisms for carbon se se sequestration to the deep sea. Hmm. I did not know that. That's Probably really cool. Consume and then die and take it down or poop it down. I wonder how long it'll keep traveling with us. Probably till the bottom. <laughs> at least he has something to look at. 
<laughs> and more on salps. They form large, dense fecal pellets that sink faster, ensuring that carbon gets below the surface mixed layer and sequestered in the deep sea. So yeah, they've got to have some density to them, otherwise they'd be kind of trapped in that upper layer. Sounds like they're really important for the carbon yeah. cycle of yeah. our planet. We have a message from um, Anna, who is a BS in marine biology. Anna says that an upwelling current can probably allow one individual to travel that far. Off the coast of Nova Scotia, they have a huge amount of upwelling around this time each year, which brings up a ton of plankton from deeper parts of the ocean. All right. I'll have to check my Instagram feed. I, I found a beautiful uh, satellite image of chlorophyll, uh, you know, estimated chlorophyll concentration along the uh, entire coast of California, uh, really from British Columbia, I think, down to Mexico almost. With uh, It was a clear, clear sky. And uh, it was a July 4th, but I don't remember the year, that I came across this image at a, uh, the a NASA site and uh, saved that for teaching purposes. But the upwelling centers were really obvious. The capes, capes and points that stick out from the coast are hot spots for coastal upwelling. And the upwelled water just doesn't necessarily stick right along the coast. There are these jets that transport it, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred kilometers offshore once it rises to the surface. Just some interesting uh, coastal currents. I think it was from a, uh, a site called NASA Worldview, where they make available the uh, multispectral imagery of you know, various channels from uh, the NASA satellites, Aqua and uh, Terra. I'm not sure if they still put the imagery from Terra out there, but certainly um, Aqua. So someone asked earlier what everyone's dream dive site would be. And I can say, since this is my first expedition, everything's a dream for me. But I'm sure some of, some of you have a specific dream site in mind. I wouldn't mind going um, to look at hydrothermal vents um, and seeing some seafloor massive sulfides, which are another type of hydrogenetic rock. <laughs> um, different from ferromanganese crust because they form from the fluids of hydrothermal vents so they have a different mineral assemblage um but also really enriched and economically valuable metals um i'm also really would be really interested to go to uh mid-ocean ridge see some lava coming up from there 
those would be my top two. Yeah, I'll come with you. That sounds fun. <laughs> Let's all go. <laughs> Got a favorite spot in mind, Leilani? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah. I was hearing music in my headphone. Uh, huh. No one else heard that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, okay, I think I have too many channels on. Sure. The Bluetooth, so. there's a Bluetooth channel. Oh, that's probably what it was. There was a lady singing in my ear. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> that I missed the question entirely. <laughs> so we're talking about dream spots to dive, to explore. Oh, I'd love to go to the Galapagos. Um, that's probably my number one. Um, I've been to Palau, which was a dream come true, so I don't mind going there again. That's definitely like a dream dive spot. Yeah, so Palau's amazing. Palau is amazing. Um, yeah, I hope to be back there again, but also explore new places. I almost found Lost City in the middle of the Atlantic. I did the Alvin dive, and the next day they went down with uh, Argus and found it. But I had actually, I think I found it first. <laughs> it was at the very end of the dive. It's like, what the heck are these things? Wow. <laughs> and if they ask us, we will support you. You found it yep. first. Yep. So Lost City is a very different type of vet site. <laughs> yeah. The uh, like white spires. Yeah. Really massive. And that's uh, off of the main axis of the mid ocean, mid Atlantic Ridge, right? It's kind of offset. Yeah. I think one of my favorite sites so it was a, an erupting volcano and we were collecting the lavas. It was coming out of the Yo. volcano with a, with a <laughs> coffee can. <laughs> 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 and uh, we were locked on the bottom with the Doppler, which looks, you know, the, the vehicle moving over the ground. And they, I started moving backwards all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, we're losing lock. But I was locked to the ground. But the oh. ground was moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty awesome. It was throwing big rocks up in the water column. <laughs> where, where was that? That was near Guam. Uh, jealous. <laughs> That's a risky collection. Yeah. <laughs> Some sophisticated technology with the coffee cans. Yeah. Megan, how about you? Do you have a dream spot in mind for the future? Well, I'm always down for any deep, high density deep sea coral communities. So uh, there are a lot of spots that would be really interesting to check out. But I, uh, I plan to dive at Kalua Rock, which is a small little rock, a um, little southwest of Kauai. And we were going to dive there, but then there was ship trouble on the day of my planned dive and I never got to dive there. So I always think about that dive site. Is that a place of coral diversity? Yeah, so I, we no one's ever dove there, so oh. we don't know. Um, okay. But other areas within the Hawaiian Islands have been full of high density communities and uh, the dive, dive prior to oh. the dive I didn't get to do was at Middle Bank and it had taken three years to be able to dive at this site because the, the Navy kept telling us we couldn't dive there. They were using that area uh, for testing or operations, something that they were doing. Um, so they wouldn't allow us to go and dive there. Finally got to do this dive and it was just absolutely amazing. So many like gorgeous corals. Uh, we started a little bit deeper, uh, around 500 meters, and we saw these massive gold corals, bamboo coral. As we got shallower, um, there was lots of 
dense communities of black coral and near the uh, shallowest area of the dive, we couldn't even see the rocks because it was just carpeted in biology. Mm. So it was a really amazing dive. We even saw a fish that a fish expert couldn't ID. Ooh. Said that it was possibly a new species that hadn't been identified before. So it was a really exciting dive and Kluwer Rock isn't that far away from Middlebank. And so I was pretty stoked for this dive, um, but then we didn't get to do it. So I always think like, well, what if we could go over there and do that dive? What will we find? I feel sure you'll get there. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, when is the ship going to be in that area? Is it going to fit into the cruise plan and the objectives? Kind of looking forward to a shallow dive near Kingman Reef. I hope we're able to fit it in. It's uh, it's one of the possibilities yeah. over the next few days. But yeah, I shallow like dives shallow are days. pretty <laughs> exciting. Yeah. And also it's easier for uh, navigation because the ship moves and the ROV moves a lot faster. <laughs> yeah. So we can cover ground and collect samples without that delay. It's kind of nice. So how shallow are we talking? Uh, like 500, 200 meters. Uh, and Corley, this is in part to support your research, right? Um, there probably won't be any uh, crust uh, shallower than 600 meters, but who knows? Yeah, I think we'd probably start a little bit deeper for Corley's stuff, probably around 1,000 and make our way up. Yeah, and we'll have to watch water temperatures. Yeah, usually you don't want to go too much above, what, 200 meters because it just gets too hot, right? Well, yeah, well, I mean, we can we can kind of compensate by not putting as much oil in the reservoir. Oh, okay. so. That's not even something I've ever thought of, that the temperatures could be too warm for the ROVs. Yeah. Because you always think of cold right. when you think of down, down on the ocean. But you, you said you can compensate for water temperature? Yeah, me too, a bit. I don't know. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how hard you have to drive and stuff. So. I mean, we were getting pretty shallow doing the, the Amelia Earhart mm -hmm. expedition. So. And that's certainly tropical water. Yeah. So. Yeah, the surface temperatures around here are about 80. Pretty toasty. Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the electronics don't really like that too much. Oh, the electronics are okay. It's yeah. the hydraulic yeah, like pressure. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't so. mind to swim in, in those hmm. temperatures. Uh, we may be able to fill the tub out there during one of these dives. So for the person asking about internships, um, our internships usually run between two to five weeks. And you can find more information about them through our website on Nautilus Live if you just search for internships. And the application period will be opening sometime this summer for the 2023 season. Again, I encourage everyone to follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter so you can stay up to date for when application periods open and for all the other wonderful things that we're doing.
Um, have we ever seen an actual Nautilus on our dives? I have not. I, yeah, I think I have. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I have not seen a Nautilus on a Nautilus dive. I saw some nice video from the Falcor uh, operations with their Sebastian ROV over in the Coral Sea. Uh, last year, two years ago, several Nautiluses swimming around. Oh, I would love to see that. Just bobbing. <laughs> I love the way they swim. It's yeah. just like really adorable. Well, you feel like you're looking back in time when you look at them. I did. They are ancient, ancient creatures. I made a crochet Nautilus. <laughs> oh. oh. That's a nice tuna wow. for. Yeah, that was pretty. Oh. Oh. oh I got some more stuck on the <laughs> Oh no. Oh, I like the organisms. Wow. <laughs> Can we pan up and see if it's still Wow. This is getting crazy. <laughs> We're just collecting things here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it probably dropped its feeding tentacle. It'll regrow it. So you think that was attached to the red one that went by? Yeah, that was attached to that red Tina 4. Hmm. Siphona 4, or Tina 4. Yeah, well, the first thing was the Siphona 4, yeah. and the red thing was a Tina 4. Oh, it was, <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's a lot going on. It's a little ocean rave. <laughs> Hopefully they're this not there forever. This is your screensaver. <laughs> so we need to get <laughs> snapshots of things down there. <laughs> they're going to be in every frame. Photobomb. Gonna try to clear them. Thirteen hundred meters. No, uh, yeah, thirteen hundred to go. And we're going down at. Uh, are we going down at thirty, Jake? Um, just under that. But pretty close. About twenty-seven. Okay. About 45 minutes to go. Yeah, 48 or so. Yeah.
just reminds me of, you know, those those weird things that wave in front of car dealerships. Yeah, yeah. Doing the dance. The wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube men? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly what Now, do other creatures eat these these stowaways? Um, I'm sure some things eat them. They're not particularly nutritious. So sea turtles like jellies. I wonder if they eat would munch on these at all. They might. Yeah. I mean. Not much there, though. I guess. Yeah. I mean. Uh, the jelly might be a little more substantial. Some of those like shallower water jellies are gonna be a little tastier, but I think they would nom one of these. <laughs> I'm just imagining how cool it would be if we saw something come in and <laughs> just be like, ooh, thank you for the snack. What are the odds we uh, land on your sea cucumber again, Emil? <laughs> Probably not that great because we're a bit off from where we oh, landed really? on bottom yesterday. Yeah. We, we could drive the ship over there if we really wanted to see that cucumber yeah. again, though. I think it's imperative. <laughs> I, I would definitely bet money on that it's still there. <laughs> it didn't do very good at the swimming thing. They're not particularly speedy. Do you see ground fault? Say again? Sure. Thanks. We have a question coming in about the strength of the cables. Um, what's the usual tension on them and, and how strong can they hold? Uh, yeah, we have uh, actually new operating parameters uh, this, this season. We're paying closer attention to our tension limits. Uh, but uh, our normal, our, our, our max tension we're seeing right now is about 13,000 pounds on the on the winch and uh, our, our limit is uh, if we see anything greater than 20,000 pounds any single instance we have to come up until it drops drops back down um, and if we see uh, more than five instances of 15,000 pounds of tension in like a span of 10 minutes then we have to come up as well until our 
tension goes down. So the farther we pay out our cable, the deeper we go, the more tension we usually see. And then it also depends on uh, like the surface heave that we're getting. So the more the ship moves, the, the more Argus moves and there's more tension. So that tension could change as the ship pitches um, in the swell, and so we'll just have to keep an eye on the weather on these, uh, mm. uh, especially on these longer dives when we've got all that cable paid out. Emil is our expert weather predictor. Well, I got a. You saw all Navy meteor, uh, Navy oceanographers get a master's in meteorology and oceanography. And I stuck around and did a PhD in physical oceanography, but I got some experience in weather forecasting for the aircraft carrier battle group, the Lincoln battle group. Now they're called strike groups. It's tricky to forecast when you're in the middle of the ocean because you don't have any observations. Mm -hmm. uh, you got some buoys here and there and satellite data to feed the models in the u.s so on the u.s east coast you've got weather stations all across the continental u.s telling you what's on the way and all these weather radars mm -hmm. so there's rarely a surprise But I did look at the satellite imagery a couple of days ago, and we were under a mass. You know, we're in the intertropical convergence zone where the lot of cloud cover. <coughs> and uh, we were under a pretty large cloud mass that would feature frequent showers, which is what we've been seeing the past few days. I know Megan got surprised by one. <laughs> So we've got some input on predators of jelly mm. animals uh, from our fish, our, our uh, biologist, Ken Sulak. Um, and I will give it my best shot at some of these pronunciations. <laughs> but uh, Aleppo cephalodoid fishes. Yeah, that's the fish that I said that we saw last night. Uh, okay. The slickheads. In the families uh, Platytroxidae which are mostly midwater, and Aleppo cephalodate, mostly near bottom, both specialize on jelly animals, mm. which contain a surprising amount of readily digestible protein. Consider about 80, 90, 80 to 90% water in jelly animals, whereas humans are 66%. It's a lot of water, but I guess enough protein. Mm. To uh, cause these fishes to specialize in eating them. So maybe we will have some visitors.
Wow, yes, this is um, this is specialized, all right. The, the Aleppo fishes have specially modified gill arches called crumenol or epibronchial organs that crunch jellyfish, salps, tenophores in the pharynx and behind in the throat, there's a thick layer of resilient tissue that absorbs the arrowhead tip nematocysts of jellies and siphonophores to prevent damage to the gut. Lots of research on this topic by Russian scientists decades ago. That certainly is a specialized. Yeah, when you've got tissue that's there to absorb the stinging cells, that's pretty good. That's evolution for you. I'm a sucker for evolution fun facts, those kind of things. We have an interesting comment coming in about a jelly-like creature, um, Phronima amphipod. And according to this user, they use their claws and mouth parts to rearrange the remainder of the animal they are eating into a barrel shape. They lay their eggs in the jellyfish barrel and <laughs> swim around the water to keep fresh supply of oxygen to the eggs. Whoa. Yep, those are pretty cool. Uh, they're basically also uh, the... Uh, inspiration for the movie Alien. Oh, oh goodness. Oh, wow. That's a pretty cool title to have. Like, oh, you know, no big deal. Just inspired one of the best horror movies of all time. <laughs> yeah, but like, when you take into account that this amphipod is like centimeter. Teensy. <laughs> super <laughs> tiny. Not quite as threatening. I mean, it's pretty cute. There's so many parallels between deep sea exploration and space exploration, and I love how that's expressed in the media. Albeit fiction, it's still fascinating. And more from Ken here. Uh, via parallel evolution, both sea turtles and stromatioid fishes, the near surface ocean fishes, have developed spiky muscular pharyngeal bulbs or mills to mash up jelly animals, just like slick heads. But in a different way. They both solve the problem from coming at it from different angles. Again, evolution at its finest. Yeah.
I remember in college writing a 15-page paper on the evolution of the turtle shell, and mm -hmm. the consensus was they don't know. <laughs> For those just tuning in and wondering where we are, we are exploring, or going to be exploring very soon, an unnamed, unexplored seamount south of Palmyra Atoll within the boundaries of the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument in the Central Pacific. And I would say we're about 900 miles from Honolulu. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe a thousand, yeah. Maybe a thousand Ballpark. miles. In between Hawaii and American Samoa, I think, is a better. Mm -hmm. On the Line Island Seamount chain. One of the questions is whether our descent is controlled or if it is like, quote, dropping a rock. <laughs> um, no, it is very controlled. Our pilots work really hard to control the descent of our ROVs. They are, in fact, legendary. So Argus hangs like a rock, but it can change its yaw. It can change its, you know, bearing. Uh, and Herc's got to drive down with the thrusters, right? Yep. And we go down a lot faster than we go up. Gravity. Uh, it's because the thruster going up is blowing onto the top of the, the uh, starboard box blowing into the stuff instead of out into the clear water. I imagine the extra weight from samples doesn't help. Uh, well, we pitch this, we try and maintain a, about 35 pounds of positive ballast. So if we pick up rocks, we gotta pitch steel plates to make up for it. Okay. I did not know that. That's fascinating. The, the steel plates on the front porch there are uh, 16 and a half pounds in water each. So there's some over on the, they're tucked underneath. You can't see them, but you can see this one over here. If you're watching, you can turn in the feed one or the quad view to see what we're talking about. You want to zoom in, Dave? That's good. You can see the rusty plate down there. Mm -hmm. So those things can rust away fairly quickly, and then it's got a natural organic line that also goes away. So the only way to do it without dropping plates like that would be to have a variable ballast system. 
and that takes up a lot of space. We don't, we're not big enough to have that. About a half hour to bottom. We're down to 210 now. Maybe we'll turn it off. One of our audience members would like to know the difference between nautical miles, miles, and leagues. Who feels like taking this one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, nautical miles, 1.1 miles. Uh, it's uh, a yeah. one, uh, yeah, well, know one minute of <laughs> longitude. The nautical mile. A league? <laughs> I don't remember a league. A league uh, is like a couple hundred feet or something. I don't know. I forget. We don't. We don't use that. No, that's an old, old timey term. measurement. Yeah. I feel like that's like one of those factoids I learned at one point, but yeah, it left hasn't your brain. really <laughs> stuck <laughs> in the brain. How about chains? <laughs> yeah. Chains? Yeah. Google it. Yeah, a league varies <laughs> in its in its distance. So not particularly useful. Right. For those who are just tuning in and asking about the swaying string that you can see on channel one, that is a siphonophore that has become attached to ROV Hercules. A league is three nautical miles. Let's in, see. In English speaking countries. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> and it was adopted as the distance one could walk in an hour. Okay. That'll be different from you yep. to me. And it depends, yeah. <laughs> miles vary. I can see why we've come up with different ways to measure things since <laughs> using that. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I could walk three miles in an hour, though. Seems reasonable. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Google usually says, like, one mile takes about 20 minutes to walk. Yeah. You know, it's sort of its standard. I suppose as far as book titles go, it's more exciting than 20,000 nautical miles under the sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we have a question about, are we absolutely 100,000% sure there is no chance that a Megalodon could be existing? Now, personally, I'm an optimist, and I like to say nothing is impossible, but it's highly, highly improbable that we're going to find a Megalodon living on the planet without us having known about it. The never, way sh never say never. <coughs> the way sharks shed teeth, we probably would have found some. Absolutely. But, you know, ask Jason Statham. He might have a different answer. Someone is asking if uh, anyone has any thoughts about Schmidt's new ship. Falcor oh, you mean two? the Falcor 2? Two. Two. -O -O. <laughs> oh, clever. Yeah. It's in parentheses. I think it's, it's big. Uh, it's really big. Apparently, it also has two saunas because one was not enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about what I know about it. And I saw that they recently donated the Felcor original. 
to Italy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, to Italy. Maybe they'll donate the octopus to us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still up for sale out there. Octopus? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a chance, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much is it? I don't remember. I, I sailed uh, a year ago with a bunch of guys that had been on the octopus. Uh, and they were bemoaning the fact that it was sitting in Sun Shipyard with a for sale sign on it. Huh. How much is it, Jake? <laughs> Get your credit card out. Yeah. <laughs> Probably like 300 million or something. <laughs> Just a little bit out of my price range. Listed in 2019 for 325 million. There you go. Hey, almost called it. Price price dropped to 278. That's Woo, not bad. That's bargain. Not bad. <laughs> Call the bank, see if they'll uh, raise your limit. <laughs> yeah. I can't even like, start, a, start a crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> what that, like, that cost means. Yeah. No. Go fund me for Jake Buys yep. Octopus. Yep. Okay. It'd probably cost 200000 a day just to operate it, you know? <laughs> Don't even want to know. <laughs> Twenty minutes. All right. <laughs> so I think we'll be able to pluck these uh, guys off or this one off uh, the porch. Jake. <laughs> <laughs> For those just tuning in, what you see on camera one is a siphonophore that has become attached to Hercules. Yeah. So we're going to try to right. gently remove the individual. And by we, I mean legendary Jake, <laughs> who is only ever going to go by that let's name from a, now let's on. Get a stick. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done for me lately? <laughs> Is it it's probably easier once we're on the bottom, right? Or going to give it a I shot? Don't know. Yeah. Why not? It's going to be drifty on the bottom. It's sort of yeah. under tension here. So. Yeah. Well, at least if you can get it attached to the claw, you can like rev it off on the sediment or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so don't stab the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get away from you. I know. Oh, it's farther in, that's why. Oh, look at that. Yeah, you're kinda getting oh. hung up in the bar up there. So I gotta bring down my shoulder, yeah. Yeah. That's how you that's oh, how you stab cameras. Making progress. <laughs> <laughs> Not part of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got it stuck on your arm, good. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. 
arm is a bit jumpy. Yeah, well, yeah, that ground falls down to 143. Yeah. So it's I definitely, it's got water on the pot. If you could tell which joint it was, that would be helpful. Which, which joint? Like the shoulder. Is it? Like the whole arm moved. Bravo. Well done. Get away. <laughs> the legend lives on. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that is some sticky stuff. Is he gone? Wrapped up. Did you see just jump up? No, I was looking at the ground fall. Yeah. Well, let's see if I can get it to do it again. Just yeah, popped up. So, yeah, it popped down. Someone wants to know um, what some memorable hitchhikers we may have found on Herc after recovery have been. We get fish stuck in it all the time. Hmm. And, uh, krill, krill is really bad. They get in all the nooks and crannies and it gets pretty smelly after a bit. <laughs> <laughs> On uh, 135, we had a whole metallogorgia with its Ophiocreus oedipus snake star huh. collected. Wow. Huh. It came up in pretty good condition. Huh. We saved it for science? Yeah, we saved it for science. Huh. So are the sample, the bio boxes made for better preservation? I mean, presumably just tagging onto the outside of Herc isn't the best way to bring something up? Yeah, that's right. Should we we want to keep our samples cold. Mm -hmm. um, that helps preserve the tissues of the animals that we've collected. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Might be doing a little maintenance on the arm. Have you been in there before? Huh. Yeah, it's been. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, if it's the shoulder, the pot, the pot for the shoulder is in the ram, so you just replace the whole ram. So this actually kind of ties into a question we just had about ROV uh, maintenance and whether there are any original parts or has any, is it continuously modified with new parts? Uh, Hertz got a lot of original parts. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's getting pretty tired. We have a lot of cracks in the frame and stuff. But we're, we're working towards a new ROV, but it's probably a couple years off, I think. We have some, like some preliminary design work going on for a new one. So if we do make a new one, it'll probably be a 6,000 meter ROV. Will it be a two body system like this? Uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna keep that because that's, you know, it's sort of a feature, right? Mm -hmm. So will Argus then be replaced? Uh, Argus is, it's got a stainless steel frame that's really rugged. Um, it's been damaged a few times by hitting the back of the ship on recoveries, but we just cut out the bad section and re-welded the new piece. The electronics got totally updated uh, like three or four years ago. So it's, it's all modern guts in it. So I think it's gonna be around for quite a while. Herc has a, actually a uh, 386 processor in it. Wow. <laughs> oh. Yeah, pretty old. <laughs> Those were big in like 1990. Yeah, that's its vintage, its electronics. Vintage. <laughs> <laughs> So what new technologies would you wish to incorporate into a new ROV? Um, well, just overall electronics wise, we would want to have um, <coughs> split things up more so that we have uh, the ability to uh, monitor each power circuit individually. The way Herc is now, it's like everything's common. So if we get a ground fault, it carries through the whole electrical system. And that's not very ideal. So the only way to, you know, isolate what the problem is is by turning things on and off and trying to <laughs> unpack to find it. It would be better if it just, you know, it alerts you that there's a ground fault on this particular instrument. Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. So that's what, you know, like Jason and and uh, Alvin and, and Sebastian all have that sort of capability. Mm -hmm. We want to have more Ethernet. We do have Ethernet on the vehicle, but we want to have more ports available. So more fiber. We always or, need more fiber. Yeah, you got to have more fiber. This is a question that is specifically asked to the pilots. If you had an unlimited budget for one thing, what would you add to Herc? Well, so that our top new item that we're going for is a really fantastic 4K camera that Dave could probably talk about. That's hopefully going to be in the works soon. Yeah, we hope so. The uh, HD cameras that we have uh, uh, on Herc and usually on Argus, uh, we've got one out for repair right now, are a three chip broadcast quality uh, imager. It uses three CCD chips uh, and uh, to get the, th the three channels of video red, green, and blue uh, that are made into the picture. Uh, other cameras, uh, like the uh, Mini Zeus that we're using on, uh, on Argus right now, use a single chip and use a lot of processing and interpolation to make three channels out of essentially one. Uh, so there's some compromises in uh, resolution, there's some compromises in motion uh, capability, uh, the, you get smear between uh, pixels uh, when uh, the interpolation happens. Uh, right now the 4K camera that uh, we've been testing is a single chip camera uh, and there are drawbacks to that. The resolution is fine, uh, is very good uh, when it's uh, still, but uh, in the ocean everything moves all the time. 
uh, even if the vehicle is completely still, the water is moving, and, mm. uh, and so our objects uh, uh, tend to uh, show that, uh, that motion uh, interpretation, interpret, interpolation and smear. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, in development a, uh, uh, a three-chip broadcast quality 4K camera uh, that I'm anxious to see. Uh, I and a, a colleague of mine consulted uh, with the folks that were uh, uh, talking about developing it, and uh, we, we gave our input into uh, uh, what we'd like to see. Uh, and uh, they're, they've got a, a prototype built, and they're in the process of building uh, production models uh, as we speak. We'd like to get our hands on one of those and try it out. It's very cool. I think the other things that would be on the top of our shopping list is uh, new manipulators. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, they tend to be heavier than what we have, so we need... The oh, I don't know if your mic's on, Jake. I think uh, if you had, like, a limited budget, like you said, going, like, all electric on the vehicle would be pretty cool, because you'd bring down, like, the noise. Yeah, the problem problem is, is that we're kind of hitting the upper limit electrical wise on our umbilical, the yep. six eight cable, <coughs> and we really need to go to a bigger cable if we're gonna you need more beans for yeah more beans. All electric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're sort of the nearing the upper limit on how much power we can put down this existing cable, well, and all these whistles and bells. <laughs> Cost more juice, <laughs> more beans. Yep. But in order to go to a bigger cable, that involves a lot. Because you need a different winch. Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be heavier. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Everything gets sized up. Yeah. Cable is like, really expensive. I'm sure the bigger you go, the more expensive yeah. it gets. Yeah. The cable's the cheap part, really, <laughs> compared to. Like, you look at our hangar size, and you can't really jam a whole lot bigger oh, ROV into the hangar. So. 200 meters to go. Yeah, so you need a bigger crane to handle a bigger vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything. Is there enough room in the winch room for a bigger winch? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I already have trouble squeezing by. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. look very spacious in there. Uh, no. So all those things, and we really don't want a whole lot bigger vehicle because kind of one of the the features of Herc is it's sort of more nimble than a lot of the big monster like S Sebastian and, and uh, Doc Ricketts and stuff. Those are much bigger ROVs and <coughs> they can't get in and <coughs> into like a, a wreck and not disturb the environment like we can. Yeah. So. So is this the winch room here on uh, satellite feed three? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite large. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's not a lot of room around there to jam in a bigger one. Oh. So. Hmm. I'm not seeing anything on the sub bottom yet. Do we have the right gain set? Uh, it hasn't changed. It looks like looks like it's all right. Yeah, it hasn't changed. All right. Any time now. <laughs> We're getting there. I think I see it. You see it? Yeah, uh, just popped up. Okay. I was like, it's got to be there soon. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <coughs> We'll start getting altimeter hits at like 80 meters or so. Yeah. Yeah, that's it.
So in addition to uh, fish biologist Ken Sulak, we've got geologist Kevin Conrad on the science chat with us. This is a good question um, and a complicated one. Who decides what we're going to explore on Nautilus? Well, it goes back to some planning meetings that the uh, Consortium for Ocean Leadership hosted on exploration targets in the Pacific Ocean to set some big goals. And then our f we are funded by NOAA via the uh, Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute to then focus down on certain uh, goals within that broader guidance. And then the lead scientists for each cruise focus down even more and try to uh, strike that balance between the geology and the biology and the number of dive sites in the time allotted. Oh man, the ground falls getting way So back. it's a pretty yeah. broad team. Yeah, I imagine it's very, a lot of thought and science put into that decision making. We get inputs from scientists work. ashore for a given area that we're exploring and try to work that into the dive plans. And then finally, it's what Mother Nature will permit. <laughs> so uh, that's why we're focusing on the southern part of this uh, EEZ or exclusive economic zone around Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. Not all Nautilus uh, cruises are funded through OACI though, right? There's other... True. Yeah. Other funding sources. Like, is Nat Geo also fund some cruises sometimes? Some, some parts of uh, our exploration, yep. Um, Ocean Networks Canada. And we'll be starting a new program later in the summer um, that we're pretty excited about in conjunction with Nat Geo. So stay tuned and you'll learn more about that as the months go by. The Navy provides some support for technology testing. There are some private donations that go into our educational outreach. About 30 meters or so. Target. 
Okay. Yeah, we sort of changed heading uh, on our descent. Okay. Slow it up. Here we go. Some gutter rocks. <laughs> For those who are interested in specific careers like ROV pilot, we have career spotlight pages on NautilusLive.org where you can watch videos and read more about each of the positions and common ways that people have gotten there and paths they've taken. So I, we encourage you to read those. Uh, the altitude hurt. Oh. <laughs> Megan, can you start the sonars? Yep. So for our audience member asking about push core samples, um, they can be used to study biology, but also geology as well. And we took some yesterday. Did you reset position yet? Actually, I am not. Okay. Yeah, two, two dives ago. All right. Yeah. Uh, only one survived. <laughs> you want to stick the arm out there? So as you raise it out of the holder that all spills out um no actually they were fine it was just um when you Are you ready go for it push it down all the Are way you get like a whole stratigraphy of everything and then when you move it to the rov a lot of times it can get lost oh. and Ooh. so if you have if you've pushed it down all the way theoretically the whole thing should be core but when we take it out only like a quarter mm -hmm. a little bit at the top is there, then we don't um, use right. it because no. it's it's yeah. not usable at that point anymore. Gotcha. Mm 
Wait on columns. They are. Did you turn it on? Yeah, I was waiting on columns. Okay. Wasn't well, that didn't look like elbow? I mean, uh, shoulder, right? No. Oh, uh, uh, man, that's a bummer. I have it halted right now. as possible, so just get it out there. Good there, Dave. Center it in. up as much as possible, and then uh, let me zoom in and see how we're doing okay. here. It's bouncing around, so I kind of got to Yeah, I know. It. I can see. Uh, A little herky turkey. <laughs> I'll do right there. Just hold Just it. Leave it there, Jake. Leave it there, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Remind the arm what oh. a legend you are. <laughs> <laughs> Tell that grandpa to stop. Okay. Oh. Well, <laughs> I have to sneak up on it. <laughs> oh. oh, man. Sorry. Okay. Uh, black balance coming up. Going to black. That's better. Now we don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it works. That's fine. Be back soon. Black balance always takes about three times longer than you think it's going to. And that should be good enough. Right there. Hold on. I'm going to do it again. Oops. 17K. Uh, it's getting worse. Yeah. All right. I'm going to call that good on okay, the good. On white balance. <laughs> put that All thing away. Right. I'll put you. <laughs> do that anymore. Gonna go east. Hey. Sound good? Yep. Ready for a move? Ready. Zero nine zero looks good. Cool. Bridge now. Hey George, can we get a twenty meter move zero nine zero? Let's look out for a C pan.
Can we see if any of these rocks are available? Did you say something? You're not on SPL. Sorry. I was. I just had the microphone on. <laughs> Anything in particular? One of those. Oh, we got to turn the lasers back on. I got it. Something in here then? Yeah. I don't know if these, something, one of these two bigger ones. Are those what, the, the here? Yeah, those, those are ones attached. attached. Yeah. yeah, those are gonna be. We can look somewhere else. Right. I always thought you were talking about this one here. You want yeah. angular? No, not angular, yeah. rounded. Like extra large potato size? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cabbage size. Cabbage size. Potato to cabbage size preferred. I think all measurements should be done in units of vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emil, is this our deepest dive at this location? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Broke yesterday's record. Broke yesterday's record. Very cool. I wonder if we've broken time on bottom as well. <laughs> <laughs> Still working on it. Yeah. Further well, establishing Jake's legendary status. Probably. Or We got over here. Looks like a nice uh, large rock over there. Might be some choice ones around it. Mm -hmm. mm. Is that something in there? Or is that sand? Sand. Sand. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. That's probably attached, but might be worth a try. Yeah. Some of those might be nice. Yeah. It's a little big. Not too bad. There's a sponge. There is a sponge. And a shrimp? Mm-hmm. Is that too sedimented? A little, I think that's a bit too angular. Yeah. Too. What about this one? To the upper left? Yeah. I'll circle that again. Oh. Yeah, I see what you're looking for. Oh, Roger. All right, Jake, get in there and get that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait on comms. Uh, so while they're picking up one of these rocks, uh, someone in the science chat said that they were, uh, Jeremy Horowitz said that they were hunting for them a while back out in Coral Sea. And when they brought up the rocks that they uh, they were looking for small corals attached to the rocks, but they found really small, a few millimeters tall, carnivorous yeah, sponges on these rocks. Here. Okay. You want to back off a sec? Yeah. 
Um, and they're wondering if we find anything like that on our rocks. And actually, we did. We did bring up a rock yesterday. We do need to bring the arm up so it's not so low. Okay. Um, and we were able to find some carnivorous sponges on them, two of them, actually. It's very cool. for it. Oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's Yeah, it's budging. So. It's working like you're trying to pull a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little big. What about that one just yeah, to the left? Yeah, this one? Left? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that one might be better. Yeah. Perfect. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. Cool beans. We can put that in forward bio box A. Okay, you want to get a zoom on it first? You want porch lights? Yeah, give me porch lights. I think we should try to uh, put the rocks on the get starboard some side of this? so we can leave the forward boxes for bio stuff. Yeah. Especially with the jumpy arm right now, too. Copy that data? Yeah. Let me. Uh, Sorry, can. We'll put the. Uh, Recommendation to put the uh, rocks on the starboard side. Uh, okay. To the camera. Yeah. Sure. Starboard A. You can start off there. I think you might run into the bottom going over there, so okay. I might come up a bit. this junk. Oops, five, right? Are we zoomed out, Dave? Yes, sir. Samples, sample mode. Yeah. Pop out the pot. Try out. So which box? Starboard. Starboard A. A. Starboard A. Okay. Should be able to fit in there. You need to go yeah. up and you can. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe try E. Yeah. Yep, yeah, let's Too try big. it. E.
Nice. Okay. Oh, that was dive mode. Yep. Pretty legendary. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to like what I have to say next there. because we have an audience member who suggested a, a name for our watch. Oh, <laughs> and the name I'm just is. I'm going to turn off his for a second. You can say it though. <laughs> The name is League, parentheses, or three nautical miles, parentheses, of legends. Oh. Of attractive legends. <laughs> League of attractive wow. legends. He's <laughs> sick. <laughs> hey, okay, I'm my mom right now. Keep us moving then. Stop. <laughs> AKA followers of Jake. <laughs> Who knows? You might go back to Rhode Island. Oh, There's a, a cult following for you. No bio yet, right? No, haven't seen anything. Well, except for that sponge and that shrimp. Yeah, I saw bathy pathies. We saw that sponge, shrimp, lots of rocks. Okay, are we marching? We are moving. Do you see that little round thing on the sediment? Yeah. yeah. Let's check that out. Is it in there? So that looks like a glass sponge. And it's the type of sponge that roots in sediment. Probably in the Ferronimatidae family. Something like uh, Pylonema. hard to focus on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the same color as the sediment. Certainly camouflaged. magnified when you're zoomed in.
While we were making that rock collection, uh, Ken Sulak ashore noticed a small dark-headed fish with a transparent tail swam top to bottom of view, probably paraliparis. Paraliparis. Good with the zoom, Megan? Yep, I'm good. Carrying on. Pan right a little bit on camera. Can we do another twenty meters zero nine zero? The last sample is zero to two, right? What's that? The oh, the last sample was zero to two. Yeah, twenty two. Lots of other rocks here. Yeah. How about an angular one? <laughs> like this guy. We're kind of uh, close to the, uh, what do you call it, the depth range. How about you mean one for? Uh, Dating. Ah, uh, yes. I forgot about that. Do we want a Niskin at any point here? <coughs> no. No. Uh, Just uh, keeping an eye out for an angular rock for dating purposes. I don't know. The angular rocks we found weren't um, weren't that suitable, which I was surprised by. Yeah, not always a sure bet. Oh, um, well, we'd have to, for, to collect that sponge. We'd need to make sure there were ten organisms in the area. Uh, would Would Chris be happy with a snip of it? Uh. Um, that one was really small. Uh -huh. um, so I think it'd be difficult to get a small piece of it. Um, but yeah, if we saw something, we could just take a small piece. Uh, to identify sponges, you're looking at the spicules, so the glass pieces that make up the skeleton of the sponge. And that's all you need is a very small piece of the sponge in order to identify all the spicules. Right, yeah. We had a request from Chris Kelly ashore. So perhaps we can keep an eye out for a more sampleable one. Oh, here's a zoom. Oh, look at that. Yeah, this is that um, black cerianthid. So do you remember what I told you how to identify this from you a regular in, enemy? Second round uh, of the inner. Inner tentacles. That's right. There's also a bamboo coral off to the left. Wow. That's beautiful. You can definitely see that second row of mm -hmm. uh, mouth tentacles. So do those open up when they feed? 
because it's kind of like closed right now. Mm. Yeah, they can definitely move, back move out. them. now. Okay. Can we do another now twenty meters zero nine zero? Zoom in. You wanted to look at that bamboo coral? Yeah, let's check out the bamboo. Okay. Thank you. Hey, zoom in again, Dave. Oh, and what's to the right of it? And so there's a small bamboo, and then there's a bryozoan, a little branching corally looking thing, but it's not a coral, it's a bryozoan. So that's its own phylum, the bryozoa. They're also a colonial animal. That's a good zoom, thank you. And what was the, there was to the right, there was like yeah, this sort of a bubbly uh, looking thing. Chrysogorgia maybe. Is that what it is? According to Steve. Zoom in. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely in the family Chrysogorgia. It's a very small colony, so it could be Chrysogorgia. You can tell the Chrysogorgids because they have these uh, very fine polyps. All right, super. And all that fuzzy stuff, I think, on the rock is for foraminiferous. Like, yep. Move it on. Starting strong with a good rock, full of animals. Ooh, another one. Yeah, there's another bamboo. Can we get another zoom on this one? Zoom in, Dave. So it looks like the, uh, the first node, that black band, is really close to the base. But the second um, internode is really long. It looks like this might be a sparse brancher. What, what's going on here? Or is it just twisted? I think it's just kind of twisty. Huh. Another nice zoom. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yep. Oh, and a little fish swimming at the bottom. Oh yeah, can we get the fish? All right, to the left, lower left. Halosaur? Nope. Oh. Cuskiel. You got it. Yay, I'm learning. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got Ken Sulek on the line. He'll know exactly what this is. I think it might be a Bazazetus. So this is a fish in the family Opidiidae. Oh, he bumped into the rock. <laughs> Where the lasers are? Oh, 
Okay. Can you come down a little bit, Jake? Yep. It's very graceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we have a move on right now? Okay, we're well, we good. We're currently we gotta not get, moving. Yeah, well, I'm kind of behind the times, but yeah. Okay, we going so ahead. Uh, yep, let's move ahead. Yeah. Bridge now. Can we get a twenty meter move? Zero nine zero. Up ahead. Can't look at anything in here. There's a long legged Red shrimp. shrimp. Coming up a little bit, Jake. Yep. There's that. To answer the audience question, some creatures are attracted to the lights, some are. Um, put off by the lights. And some don't care. Some don't care at all. Someone is asking what makes the sediment in this region so light colored. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sediment is generally light colored. Yeah, it's nor the normal color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they were comparing it to um, so on the Pacific Northwest in California. I think, I suppose the sediment there was darker. Well, near shore, you're going to get a lot of impacts from land, so that might mm -hmm. color um, your sediment. But yeah, in the deep ocean, this is generally the color it is. Oh, another fish. Oh, oh and what's uh, that? Something on the rock. Yeah. There's an anemone on the rock, anemone. and then there's a fish in the upper left. Zoom in, Dave. I oh, don't know, we're not going to get a good shot of the. Uh, moving around a lot. All right. Well. Oh. 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 oh and that's an opossum shrimp. Or a mycid shrimp. They call it a opossum shrimp because it has oh, that root sac it. underneath on its belly. A what sack? A brood sack. Okay. Huh. Where it keeps its babies. Oh. It doesn't play dead? <laughs> um, probably not. It's not so a clear thing. This one looks like it actually has eggs. Oh, cool. So that brightness in the sediment uh, is due to large amounts of foraminifer and tests, which are white, according to Steve. Also, low organic material content. Thank you, Steve. Man, we are rocking and rolling here. And 
the ship's he changing heading a bit to fix that. I spot a C pen over on the left by the boulder rock. Oh, uh, it's like a right, little right stick. Down there. Yeah, this? yeah, that little stick. All right, you want to zoom in, Dave? Can you explain what a C pen is? A C pen is a type of coral. It's an octocoral. And they often root in the sediment. Ah, that's not a sea pen. It's dead sponge sock. Uh, it tricked me. It's hard to tell until you zoom, though. But we will see sea pens along our way, and I know Steve's particularly interested in getting good shots of those. What do you suppose that is between the two rocks to well, the... The little fluffy yeah. brown bit? Brownish. I don't know. Um, no, it's just some, some sort of detritus. Yeah. Maybe a piece of sponge. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. It's not a currently living organism. now. Can we do another 20 meters zero nine zero? Tilt is very slow down here. <laughs> <laughs> the pan and tilt's affected by the depth. Yeah. So it gets slower the deeper you go. Can you adjust? Yeah. You, the the speed. You can adjust it. You got to kind of guesstimate, like like yeah. in order for it to work down here, you got to make it really spicy on the surface. Surface, yeah. yeah. Another one of those same anemones? Yep, same one. Is that another glass sponge there? Yeah, that's another one of those glass sponges oh, uh, that Chris uh, is interested in. Yeah. So they might be pretty common. We might be able to grab one. Obviously, this is the second one we've observed today. Or at least snip it. In yep. the last, you know, 10 minutes. Zoom in, Dave. I do have a move on, which means that uh, our let's hold. Get I gotta, ahead I gotta, of us. I gotta hurry up. Yeah, let's hold uh, position if you can. Well, it's already in the bank. So yeah, Argus is already yeah. getting ahead of us. Yeah. So, I gotta... You can say that's number two, though. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a feeling we'll see another one. All right. All right. Moving ahead. Zoom out. Roger that. Here's a... Yeah, there's a stick. Uh, that could have been something that was alive, maybe a, a sea lily stalk.
So the green dots that you see are scaling lasers, and the distance is 10, 10 centimeters? centimeters? Yep. And that helps us determine the size of what we're looking at. If you like inches, that's about four inches. And Corley, can you explain a little bit about these rocks? Someone is asking the black rocks, are they volcanic? Yeah, so they are basaltic rocks um, that were erupted once, and then they have a coating of ferromanganese crust, or some of them have a coating of ferromanganese crust, but we can assume most of them do. Um, yeah. Ooh, a bathysaurus. Ooh, fishy fish. Bathysaurus. Bathysaurus mollus. I'm going to zoom on head and shoulders. I love their faces. They're just like so creepy <laughs> and smiley. <laughs> it looks kind of oh, like yeah. a, something you might see in, who's that? What is that, a movie person who does like the corpses